Okay, I'd like to call this public hearing to order. Uh, roll call, please. Here. Present. Here. Uh, Dr. Rothschild and Mr. Schuster are just running a few minutes late, but we'll get started. Um, Mr. Voldemort. <laughs> The purpose of said public hearing is to hear testimony and discuss the following. File the Council Number 9, 2022, establishing regulations and restrictions for the location and use of lots, land, buildings, and other structures, the height, number of stories, and size and bulk of buildings and structures, the density of population, off-street parking, and similar accessory regulations in the City of Scranton, Lackawanna County, Pennsylvania and for said purposes, dividing the city of Scranton into districts and establishing the boundaries thereof, prescribing certain uniform regulations for each such district, and providing for administrative enforcement and amendment of its provisions in accordance with the Pennsylvania Municipal Municipalities Planning Code 53 PS Section 10101 at SEC as amended. Thank you. Um, before I get to the sign-in sheet, I just want to remind everybody that uh, everyone will be given five minutes to speak. If you don't have the chance to get all your points across in five minutes, you know, we're not going to discard that. Just email us what you missed so that we do, you know, get all of your input. I think that's the goal of this here. Um, you know, although this is, although we're legally required to only have one public hearing, this, it's not our intent to only have one. This is just to start the conversation. So please keep that in mind too. Uh, first person on the sign in sheet is uh, Pat Moran. Uh, I've sent out my list of concerns. It, it revolves around two main points for me, and I, I'm a member of the South Grant Neighborhood Association. Not having enough time, uh, just this morning I found another document, 333 pages, a SAPA document, not sure if that's relevant to any concerns or issues that we might have. And the other concern is, in looking at this map, Southside is now all R11 except for areas that are in, which were existing areas that have been expanded. And that's genuine concern because that means that a lot of small home businesses and everything might be allowed right in my very neighborhood. And some of it is extremely residential. We understand that there are areas like Lower Southside, Cedar Avenue, Pittston Avenue Prospect up Music Street, Davis Street, that are already, you know, some mix. And if that has to expand, we understand that. But not the entire area. That's a genuine concern. And I'd also like to ask that, you know, we have another meeting scheduled, the larger group of associations, if we can get representation there to answer our questions after we've done more research, have more questions better formulated. Uh, that would be very helpful. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, and Mr. King, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the SAPA plan was just an overall outline that led us to right, that's, this. That's the comprehensive plan. It doesn't have any legal effect. The zone ordinance the implementing ordinance. The, the mic. Sorry. The SAPA plan was, is a comprehensive plan, which is a, an overall general plan. The zoning ordinance is a specific plan and has the weight of law where the comprehensive plan does not. And, you know, any questions we are able to answer tonight, we will. If not, we will get back to you, too. Mm -hmm. um, next on the sign-in sheet is uh, Thomas Patterson. Tom Patterson, Southside Neighborhood President. Uh, just a little off a of pat, south side is going from an R1 to an R11. And I think that's going to be an issue because this, our neighborhood has all been families from way back. And now you're going to switch it to a R11, 
which they could put a garage in or anything like that. So, and it goes all the way, I think it goes from Sanders to uh, Front Street. And the normal commercial, which is, we understand that, that's not a problem. But I think it's, this should be seriously looked at and, you know, discuss it a little more than what it is because what it, I think uh, if they keep it an R11, that it's gonna be like a mess. With, and they don't have to get approved or not. So I ask you, after you vote tonight, table this so we could have uh, further discussions and because like, like Pat said, we, have, we don't have enough time for this. We need more time. So I appreciate it, thank you. Thank you. Next on the list is Tim Schwartz. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Tim Schwartz. I'm the president of the Hill Neighborhood Association. Uh, I, I want to share with you some of the concerns that some of our residents shared about the new zoning map that has been presented to you um, with an idea asking that you would table it and give um, commu the community time to study it a little bit more and present more concerns. Um, we were concerned about the 200 and 400 blocks of Colfax um, being changed from a residential zoning uh, into a civic zoning. Uh, we have many people who still live on those blocks and around those blocks. Um, and we're concerned about that designation. Um, if we could get it to be designated as um, R10, um, Town City Single Family Residential, or R11, uh, City Neighborhood Mixed Residential, as the rest of the Hill neighborhood is, um, it'll help us preserve the historic Hill neighborhood. Um, we, are con we have numerous concerns. Um, we're concerned that the zoning changes um, was made without the input of the people who actually live on that block. Uh, we're concerned that the changes in the quality of life, of the uh, changes in the quality of life that are possible with the zoning changes, that the civic zoning um, allows for many other things that are not available in a residential zoning, um, for corporate structures and office buildings and stuff like that. We're concerned about the aesthetic changes on those blocks that um, I've heard residents say, I don't want to wake up to a parking garage across the street from me or in my backyard or next to me. Um, we're concerned about the effects of the zoning changes on the values of the houses in that part of the, the Hill neighborhood that the, the same thing, the, the aesthetic changes are going to uh, affect the cost of um, or the, the value of houses. Um, we have residents who have occupied their homes for decades lived in that neighborhood for decades. Their, their parents own the home, and they own the home. Um, it's the story of their lives, living there, and um, they're very concerned about what's gonna happen if the zoning uh, is for civic, or their street is zoned, zoned for civic. Um, if the designation of those blocks is changed to non-residential, um, we feel it's incredibly important for the residents on those blocks to have input to those changes. Um, we believe it is important for the residents of those blocks to have input into how those blo blocks look for years to come. Um, I think it's fair to them overall. Um, we're, on top of that, we're concerned about what happens a decade from now as well. If um, the hospital does not build on, those land, on that land there and ends up selling those properties, um, there's a whole world of possibilities of what can, anybody can do if they buy those properties up. Um, that's why we want it to be residential um, and not civic. Um, we will ask that as we have more time to look at this, that we can consider what the, the zoning change is. It's the only, I think it's one of the few places in the Hill neighborhood that was changed. Um, we, we would like to, ha as um, the people before me said, we would like to have more time. And, and personally, um, at a meeting last week, one of the things that I heard was 
that the city is looking for the neighborhood associations to um, go through the, tell their residents that um, there's a new zoning plan out. Um, most of the neighborhood associations are floundering. It's a, too big of a burden for neighborhood associations to do. And I think I would like to encourage the city or zoning board or planning board or whoever to find a better plan so that people in our neighborhoods uh, can know about the changes to their neighborhoods. Um, we've had two weeks to consider it, three weeks to consider it, and you know, frankly, if I wasn't involved in the eight, uh, Hill Neighborhood Association, I'd have no idea about a, a new planning change or a new zoning change. Uh, so I would push or encourage the city to somehow find a way to get the news out to everybody, um, more than you know, to, through. The Hill neighborhood, which has 15 people, come to a meeting once a month, um, and an email list of 250 people. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tim. And just on uh, just a couple of uh, Tim's points there, um, in terms of, I know that Guy Singer is a big issue um, up in the Hill, and I am, I have reached out to Guy Singer to try to set up a meeting with representatives from Guy Singer as well as the neighborhoods to. For them to present what their plans actually are because i think there's still some you know uncertainty in the neighborhood in terms of what their actual plans are so i'm hoping to get that meeting set up within the next few weeks um and you know i will get it out to anybody who brings that up tonight as well as uh, anyone in that area just to see you know just to get in a room and on that um in terms of the timing this is just the start of the process like i said this is you know, are going to be our first public hearing. It's not going to be our last. Um, we're not trying to jam this down anyone's throats. We really, you know, want your input, and I think that's what this forum creates. Um, so I don't know if, Don, you don't have anything? Okay. Uh, Jessica Nolan is next on the list. Good evening. My name is Jess Nolan. I'm a homeowner on the 1700 block of Vine Street. Um, at a meeting of the Hill Neighborhood Association on Wednesday, February 23rd, I was informed that the proposed SAPA plan would change the zoning of my property and those nearby from residential to civic or institutional. This would allow buildings up to 100 feet tall to be built around my single family home. I'm here to ask the City Council to table your vote on the SAPA plan and amend, amend the plan so that the 200 and 400 blocks of Colfax continue to be zoned as residential and not civic or institutional. This summer, rumors were going around our neighborhood that Geisinger was buying up properties on the 200 and 400 block of Colfax. This seemed curious to me because those were clearly single family and multifamily dwellings. Um, but after I saw the SAPA plan, the acquisition of those properties made more sense. Um, was Geisinger consulted during the SAPA planning process? Um, if so, why weren't property owners also consulted prior to finalizing the SAPA plan? The consultants for the SAPA plan did an excellent job of providing clear criteria for each type of land use. They also provided public realms drawings that show what a typical property looks like with the, that zoning classification. So if you look at the sketches for civic and institutional, you'll see what looked like a large cultural center surrounded by a green space and essentially what looks like a college campus. Um, if you were to fly a drone over the 200 and 400 blocks of Colfax right now, you would see a combination of single and multifamily dwellings. Um, and furthermore, it'd be hard to achieve the proposed look and feel, at least on the west side of the 400 block, when the hospital has yet to purchase so many of the residential properties on that side of the street. Um, the hospital likes to say that it wants to be a good neighbor, and to be sure, there are many good works and good people affiliated with the hospital. Yet, to my knowledge, those responsible for the expansion, expansion have not held one community meeting of their own volition. Thank you, Councilman Donahue, for trying to initiate that. Um, and so all we know about what's happening there is through rumor and word on the street. Um, in the fall, Geisinger sent out a community pulse newsletter that referred to the GCMC and the Hill community. At this point, the hospital had purchased or was under contract with multiple properties. I was sure that there would be an update on their plans to expand. And yet when I open the newsletter, nothing. A good neighbor doesn't make major changes to the neighborhood that will impact quality of life and property values without informing and ideally consulting with their neighbors. 
Also troubling is that the purchase of these homes comes at a time when housing and rental properties are in short supply and many in our city are having trouble finding an affordable place to live. Let me be clear, I am not opposed necessarily to the hospital expanding. I can believe that there are medical services that the hospital could provide that would benefit the Scranton area. What I am opposed to is giving Geisinger carte blanche to build as they please without ever having to appear before a zoning board or to notify or involve the community. If the SAPIC plan is approved as proposed, then the hospital would have no obligation or incentive to solicit input or make revisions based on community input. And while I appreciate the opportunity to sit down with them, any sort of informal verbal agreement is not going to be enough for somebody like me. Um, I'd like to believe that the hospital would solicit community feedback, even if it wasn't mandatory. Um, I'm not op optimistic. As of today, the hospital has provided no details on what they plan to do with the properties they've purchased. They've not held one community meeting. As a behavioral scientist, I know that without strong external pressures, past behavior is the best predictor of future behavior. Amending the plan, as I and others have requested, would provide an incentive for Geisinger to work with the community as they prepare to bring their expansion plans before the zoning board. So if you believe that homeowners like myself have a right to know and have a say in what is happening next door, in our backyards, or across the street, then I encourage you to table your vote on the SAPA plan today and amend the plan to reflect the existing zoning of the 200 and 400 blocks of Colfax as residential. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. And just a reminder too, like, like I said, we do plan on holding another public hearing. Our, the legislation is currently tabled, and until that time where we do hold a second public hearing, it will stay on the table until that time, just so everyone is aware on that issue. Um, next on the list is Joe Weschler. Council. Um, Joe Wexler, member of the East Mountain Residents Association. Uh, let me first by saying uh, there is a need for a new zoning ordinance. Um, our old ordinance is over 30 years old and there's been so many things that have changed in the world uh, that our zoning ordinance does not address. Um, during my time on the zoning board, uh, cell phone towers kept coming up. Then we had drone usage. Then we had the home businesses now created by the COVID pandemic. So there is a need for a new zoning ordinance. The second thing I'd like to point out is we hear um, anyone that runs for office, local, national, state, the first thing they talk about is neighborhoods. We're for the neighborhoods. I've been for the neighborhoods my whole life. The way that you protect neighborhoods is through the zoning ordinance. This is the most important, of, most important part of neighborhood legislation that's been passed in 30 years. The fact that you have this group of people who came out to talk about it uh, lets you know how important it is. Um, the other thing is there is not going to be a, ground, a groundswell of questions coming from the public. The public doesn't get the zoning ordinance. It's boring. It's, has, it's, there's no excitement to it until they get a notice in their neighborhood of a posted sign that there's a hearing and it's going to affect their block. Then people come to the zoning boards. So this is, this is so important. Um, the thing that I would recommend, and I'm not sure how much involvement Mr. King had, and I have great respect for Mr. King. He knows more about planning than anyone in the area. But my understanding was this plan was written by a consulting, a consulting firm. Um, the consulting firm, as far as I know, did not contact any neighborhood association, not, not a one. And, we, and we're, the one, we're the ones that have been doing zoning for forever. I would suggest that a meeting be held with the consultant to let us know their thinking on how they can make such changes that we heard about what's going on up in the hill. Obviously, they had some input about future plans that weren't shared with the rest of us, unless they're very good guessers at what, what's going to happen there. Um, we also need a detailed comparison of the old ordinance to the new ordinance. I mean, I know how to read the old code. I don't know the old code, but if someone asks me a question, I know how to go back, and I'm sure you guys know how to do it as well. You can go back and read the code. We need to say, I mean, I looked at the, the section for East Mountain. It's exactly the same as it was, but the permitted uses have changed. So things that used to be need, needing a variance or a special exception do not need that anymore, which is, to me is a, is a huge problem. I think right now um, our zoning board 
issues too many variances, it issues too many special exceptions, and um, because it's not a deal making, the zoning board is not a deal maker. It's, it's not to make the neighbors happy or, I mean, I've sat through a lot of them with uh, CMC and Geisinger where we're negotiating how to make the neighbors happy and how to make CMC happy. Well, that's not what the zoning ordinance. The zoning ordinance says this, this can be here, this can't be here, and you need a real reason why it, to change that. So this, is, this part of it is very, very important, and I appreciate the work that council has undertaken. Uh, like I said, I would like the administration to contact the uh, original writer of this plan, that they can come down and sit with us. I know the contract may be expired, uh, I'm, I can't believe that there wasn't a public input session that should have been part of that contract. I, I don't know if we didn't do it or it wasn't part of it, but it was a mistake not to have that in there, I think. Um, going forward, like I said, that, that's what I would like to see. Uh, just a comparison to the old ordinance and to the new ordinance and, and, and see what we need. Thanks for your Thank time. You. Thank you. And that document is being put together, and as soon as we get it, we'll make sure we get that out to everybody. Um, next on the list is Laura Augustini. Uh, I'm Laurel Augustini. I am from the Green Ridge Neighborhood Association. I'm the current president. The major concern of the Green Ridge Neighborhood Association is to maintain our neighborhood atmosphere as it exists presently. While we understand the zoning ordinance needs to be updated, we have concerns about some of the proposed changes to the ordinance, specifically some of the added permitted uses. Green Ridge has four different zones within its boundaries, R9, town mixed residential, R10, town city single family residential, N, city neighborhood mixed use, and I, town city institutional. The basis of most of our concerns are the same across the various zones. How will they affect the neighborhood, the immediate neighbors, and the value of the individual properties? R9 and N10 appear to add several permitted uses that previously either weren't permitted or required variance, special exception, or were conditional. These include bed and breakfast, short-term rental, oil and gas extraction, and wineries tasting rooms. Bed and breakfast, short-term rental, and wineries tasting rooms will impact the immediate neighbors by affecting the availability of parking, which is already at a premium in Green Ridge, as many homes do not have driveways or garages. Wineries slash tasting rooms can fast become more bar tavern-like as they are permitted to sell or provide alcohol made in Pennsylvania, which includes hard spirits. Parking and noise would both be, would both be concerns regarding them. This oil and gas extraction seems more appropriate for a light industrial zone. With oil and gas extraction comes tra truck traffic, not only in the initial construction, but also during its operation. Our roads are not built for a lot of traffic, especially tr truck traffic. Green Ridge seems to be one of the last neighborhoods considered for paving by the city because although we account for a significant portion of tax revenue for the city, the city is not able to use grant money to pay for our paving. Our streets get paved by utilities, not the city of Scranton. Oil and gas extraction in Green Ridge would certainly decrease the value of homes in the area, something the city of Scranton can scarcely afford. City neighborhood mixed use and town city institutional all also allow for oil and gas extraction. We have those same objections. Town city institutional appears to permit more types of entities than what one would think belong in an institutional zone, including bar slash taverns. Greenwich has two institutional zones within its boundaries, one that encompasses Marywood University and the other that encompasses what has been referred to as the Oral School Marywood South and it currently is called the Patriot Resource Center. Again, parking, noise, and property value are all things that come to mind regarding permitting a bar or tavern in these locations. We're not totally against the new permitted uses in these zones. Rather, we are concerned about these types of establishments just showing up with no prior notice to the neighbors and or neighborhood association. We would request that these establishments be special exceptions or conditional uses, which would require them to go before the zoning board, the planning commission, and or city council. While we understand most, if not all, these establishments require permits, et cetera, from various municipal entities, including the city, county, and possibly the state, we would prefer a more transparent process, especially given the city's history. This is not an all-inclusive list of concerns, but I believe it brings forth the most pressing. It may be repetitive, but I reiterate the request to the council table this for an extended period of time. We've had less than a month to get all of this together. 
I'm not sure what type of communication can be implemented to make sure those citizens who are interested have time to review the new ordinance, but I would hope that we could engage this, um, the Scranton Times and other media outlets using social media to kind of get this information out. Perhaps we can make it more prominent on the city website. I know many of us may not have been aware of what was permitted in our neighborhoods. Again, you guys are addressing this, and it would be helpful if there was some way for us to compare those from, one, from side by side from before to the, to, to the next. And you can explain exactly what is changing, and perhaps more importantly, not changing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next on the list is Dave Cauley. Hi, I live on the 1700 block of Vine Street. Jessica is my neighbor. I've been there for 23 years now. Um, this deal is not giving me the warm fuzzies. We didn't know that they were buying up properties until Jessica talked to a neighbor in the middle of the summer and found out that they were doing this. When we contacted Wayne Evans and asked, he's like, oh yeah, we forgot about you guys. And a few weeks later, we got an offer so we went house hunting. We both have three-story Victorians that are hard to replace around here. And we, they definitely did not give us an offer that you could buy something like that somewhere else in the city or anywhere else. Um, then they came back about three, four weeks later and said, you know what? We don't want to buy your property. So I have Jessica on one side and Guy Singer is now the other two sides of my backyard. I have no idea what they plan on putting up there. They haven't talked to us, they haven't consulted us. That's the, the situation we're in. It could be a huge building, it could be a parking garage. We don't know, they haven't talked to us, we haven't seen any plans, no plans have been announced. We got the propaganda newsletter like Jessica got, not a mention in it about what they wanted to do with all the properties. Um, first couple of snowstorms, they didn't even shovel the sidewalks on the properties that they bought. You know, poor Doris is going up and down the street with her dogs because she can't make it on sidewalks. So that's, you know, we would like some sort of input or at least to know what's going on so we can, you know, explain to them how whatever they're doing is going to affect us. And we're, we are looking to set up that meeting I'm hopeful it could we understand that progress is, is progress but yes you know the people who they're leaving out and building basically circling the wagons around us we would like to know what they're doing so we can know how this affects our standard of living absolutely thank you thank you uh, next on the list Ed Skitty Good evening. Am I moved by mask? Thank you. I have to admit this kind of snuck up on me. Uh, I've been on North Avenue for 35 years. Uh, my wife and I raised two great kids, both of them unfortunately in Philadelphia. Unfortunately, because she has a difficult time with that, I think it's not bad having them two hours away. But I had to think about appearing before this body I guess five or six years ago. Is Mr. Wexler still here? Joe, when did you guys rezone the Audubon School? Probably about seven years ago. Seven years ago? I've been fighting sometimes a one-man fight against CMC and Geisinger since I've been living there. Uh, some of you may know that my involvement with the city includes uh, I spent uh, four years as a solicitor to controller Joe Corcoran, followed by city solicitor for Mayor Jimmy McNulty, and I spent seven years as a zoning board solicitor for Mayor Jimmy Connors. So I have a pretty good idea how things work in the city, uh, and I know, such, I know th about things like uh, pressure that sometimes elected and appointed officials receive from entities within the city that feel that they have the clout to make things happen their way. But I started to talk about that rezoning. I appeared that evening because the hospital was asking to have the Audubon School rezoned without any plan whatsoever for what they intended to do with the property. I pleaded with council that evening to 
deny the request for a zoning change, at least until the hospital came in with something definitive that the neighbors would have an opportunity to consider. And maybe we agree, maybe we don't agree, but I have to go back to 1993 when some of the people in this room, including my neighbor, Mr. Barrett, who was here, we spent a ton of time on the 93 amendment. Fundamental in that document was the idea that Mulberry Street was going to be the Berlin Wall, the Great Wall of China, whatever you want to call it, between the institutions and the residential neighborhood. So I came that evening and I pleaded with council not to change it because I knew that would be the beginning of the end. So the council, by a four to one vote, voted to rezone again without any idea what was going to happen there. The hospital, not too long after that, tore the building down. And one of the speakers talked about the hospital always wanting to be a good neighbor. I, I have to chuckle when I see they want to be a good neighbor. We had a meeting, a few of us in the neighborhood, with some representatives of the hospital. Dave, was it last year? We asked, they asked us, you know, what can we do to improve our relations with the neighborhood? So we suggested, among other things, um, that uh, they do something about the beep, beep, beeping noise on the garage exit, which in the summertime when it's 70 degrees at night and your windows are open, it sounds like it's in your backyard. You don't need it under state law. You don't need it for insurance purposes. They have a flight flashing red light for people who are hard of hearing. So it was just a necessary. And we asked them to clean up that open sore where the school used to be. And open sore is about the most generous way I could describe it. And any of you who have been up that way have seen it. So we asked them to screen it, plant it, do something with it, but don't just leave it the way it is. Not only did they do nothing, but for the last six or eight months, whatever they were doing, they do piping underneath the city, they were allowing the contractor to use it as a staging area in the backyards of some of the highest tax producing real estate in the city. So I'm happy that I finally got tuned into this thing. I do plan to participate aggressively. Um, I plan to uh, bring in expert testimony, including a traffic engineer. Try to imagine cars going down Mulberry Street to Harrison Avenue, the width of that roadway. There's no access there. Also plan on bringing in a realtor who will tell you what any kind of development other than residential is going to do to property values. Just take a ride on a nice spring day in the next couple of weeks up in Mulberry. Take a left on Arthur and drive down those two blocks. There are not many neighborhoods in the city that are like that. We intend to fight for it. Geisinger knew what they had when they bought that property. And we want to keep them right where they are. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next on the sign-in sheet is Joan Hodawanitz. Joan Hodawanitz, city resident. Um, this ordinance hasn't been updated since 1993. That's 29 years. And I'm going to assume it may be another 30 years before the next update comes out. So in my opinion, it not only needs to address current issues, but things you can foresee that are going to be issues in the next 10, 20, even 30 years. And there are two issues that I thought were not properly addressed. Stormwater management and electric vehicles. Stormwater management, I mean, it became the city's problem when we sold the sewer authority back in 2016. We're coming up on five plus years on that. And if you look at page 45, you will find all of 46 words, which basically read as, uh, as follows. All state regulations and city ordinances apply. There's no list of the regulations and ordinances, nothing else. It's like, well, don't worry about it. Uh, there's nothing to worry your pretty head about. I have a feeling that stormwater management is going to be a big deal in the future. 
And, you know, whether you have a commercial building with a humongous parking lot and a flat roof, or you have a single family dwelling, these are issues that the public needs to know, especially anybody who wants to develop land or buildings in the future. And then electric vehicle charging stations. Um, that isn't even addressed at all. We talk about gas stations in quite some detail, and obviously we should because of the risk of fire and fuel leaks. We talk about solar and wind energy. We talk about wireless communication antennas, but not a word about electric vehicle charging stations. Now, the last time I looked, one of the issues with electric vehicles was the batteries tend to catch fire and they pose their own pollution risks. Um, so I, I, I don't know, you know, what the mindset or what the requirements were when, when the RFP was put out for this contract. But I'm telling you, there are currently charging stations in the city. You got three at the University of Scranton. You got one at 117th North Washington, 140 Adams, 417 Linden, 1001 North Washington. But we don't address the issues. Do you need fencing? Do you need a setback? What are you going to do if there's a fire? What, what parking regulations are you going to enforce? All that's addressed for gas stations, but not a word for these new electric vehicles, and they're coming. Your own legislation, 10 electric vehicles for LIPS and the charging stations to support them. So I think somebody needs to do some homework on this before this regulation is finalized. How many people live downtown in apartments? How much money has been invested in building these, renovating these buildings into apartments? Mr. Basilea wants to build a 17-story high-rise uh, downtown across from the Forum. Those people, 10, 20 years, and they have electric vehicles because gas-powered engines are going away, where are they supposed to charge those vehicles? So I think somebody needs to sit down and do some thinking about that. You may not have all the answers, but at least address the questions so that people are thinking in that regard. Because I guarantee you, 20 years from now, those are the people coming to the zoning board. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the list is Karen Foster. Good evening, Council. I am the president of the West Granton Hyde Park Neighborhood Watch, and I just want to share and concur with most of the other neighborhoods about the um, permitted uses that have changed and not necessarily changing like in the hill section, changing a whole section to something else, but the permitted uses. And the other concern is the uh, accessory areas that are, have ex uh, permitted uses that in the past would have needed to have a variance. Um, I, like other times, come here um, to address a problem, but also to offer a solution. I took it, um, an opportunity to speak with Todd Poosley this evening because he is part of the Planning Commission. And I addressed many of the concerns that had come up with our meetings with the other neighborhood associations. They, as a whole, see this as a draft and expect that there will be some sort of um, changes coming back from input, but also realize that because of the time of length of time this has gone by, there may have been people coming to the meetings when they were doing planning, but it wasn't maybe the people that are involved in the neighborhood associations now because of the time frame. Or they didn't identify themselves as being a part of a neighborhood association. With all that, um, there is the understanding that not, they feel that they are not planners for city planning. I myself can and can attain when I first read it over it all seems like it makes sense until you were here before and knew what the old ordinance was and how it's going to affect us now. They are amenable to having meetings with the groups and to try to hammer out what the situations are. 
I also asked about the planner, if they had put a side-by-side -side comparison report together so that we don't have to do it again if it already exists. And he said he will look into it. And he assured me that the next meeting that we have with the neighbors uh, later this month, that he should be able to have most of those answers available to us. So I see this tonight is very positive that we are paying attention and this is not going to just get slipped under the rug. And everyone here, I believe, is looking for the best interest of our neighborhoods in our city. West Granton is the largest geographical area and we've got a bit of all of the new names and uh, locations and, and how that's gonna affect. Now, if you weren't there and realized that, well, there was, there was homes there before it was zoned that way, so they, a lot of them have come to realize that, yes, there's going to be a junkyard next to me now. And those are things they, they've had to live with as we evolved um, as a city. But I think it is important to, at least with a committee, decide who, Pete, who needs to be hearing this and how we are able to reach out to the community to get as many responses to this. And as someone who has to represent um, the situation, I think it's only fair to give us enough time so we can ask the, answer the, at least the most general questions about how this process goes, since it is so time consuming to go back and forth from the old plan to the new one. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next on the list is Doris Koloski. <clears throat> I beg your indulgence because I'm not really a public speaker. I actually agree with everything they said. I'm not going to try to be redundant. I'm here just to plead my case. I bought my first home in 1968 after we got out of the U.S. Air Force, spe specifically for the location, 1718 Mulberry Street, near Audubon School, Dag Park, and at that time the hospital was a plus with small kids. When the hospital wanted to build a parking garage in 1973, we moved around the corner. All my friends were leaving the city for Clark Summit, but we stupidly stayed. I'm here to ask City Council to amend the SAPA plan so the 200 and 400 blocks of Colfax are changed from civic to residential to reflect the existing use on those blocks. We've been paying taxes and updating and improving our property continually. By changing our zoning to civic, you are punishing we homeowners by rendering our properties unsaleable to anyone but the hospital, who have already said they are no longer interested in my side of the block. Our properties will no longer have any value, even with all the money that we have put in to keep them up. No one is going to buy a home with a parking garage, heliport, crematorium, garbage dumpster, or any other unsightly structures across the street. With this proposed change in zoning, the hospital can now offer us whatever they want for our properties, knowing we will have few options. People on Arthur Avenue will have ungodly light shining into their windows, keeping them from sleeping and reasonable enjoyment of life, just like the residents' friends of mine on the 300 block of Wheeler do from the parking garage on Mulberry Street. I'm sure that Geisinger, with all their high-paid attorneys, would not have spent over a million dollars on houses before they checked out being able to rezone. This leads me to believe that they knew it would not be a problem and rezoning to a civic was a done deal for them. The timing of something that took 30 years in the making is not a coincidence in my mind. The 200 and 400 blocks should be zoned as they are in an updated SAPA plan, plan residential blocks with single and multiple family dwellings. If the hospital would like to build on these blocks, they should have to go through the process of applying to the zoning board for variance or a spot zone. This would require them to provide specific plans for the development and the public could review and provide feedback. Without this amendment, the hospital will have no legal obligation to seek input from the community before expanding their operations. Thank you for your time and consideration. Then I jotted a few more things, I'm sorry. If they put a parking garage across the street from me, I'm directly across from where Audubon School was. When they tore down Audubon School, I ended up at Sloan Kettering for lung infection, because I'm a transplant um, survivor, so far survivor. 
And I ended up back in there for three weeks in the hospital with a lung infection from the various bad things that were flying around. Now, I don't want a parking garage across the street from me because, first of all, when we sit on our porch, we don't want to breathe in the fumes of the cars coming in and out. And like Ed mentioned about the beep, 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 beeps, I hear them in my house all the time from the one on Mulberry. If I sit, go in my bathroom, I'm looking right into them. And at night, the lights are shining, car, car um, alarms are going off, and nobody goes over to you know, see whose car it is. It could go off for hours. Um, the blocks right now still have all houses on them. They, um, they, own, they only on the even side, I live on the odd, odd side, 409, on the even side, the house right next to the empty lot where the school was, uh, that has not been sold. I, I spoke to the homeowner yesterday and he told me he didn't know if he was going to sell. They actually offered him one of the houses they bought on my side of the street if he would move out and pay him for his house, but he still hasn't decided because it has a very big yard. He's getting around with a cane and he doesn't know if he wants to. And he's been in that house, I think since 1953, he said, and he owes nothing. The same with me. I can live in my house because all I need is my utilities and my taxes. I mean, we don't, our house has been paid for since 1973. My house is handicapped equipped. When Wayne Evans first called me, uh, the first time he called a year before he start, they st actually started this stuff and they said, oh, if you sell us your house, you can live in it until they want to do the project. It could be two years, it could be five years, it could be ten years, and you'd only have to pay utilities and da-da-da-da-da-da. Then he called back and said, well, no, you can't do that because the lawyers decided that would be a liability, you would have to get out. Then he said I had to get four people, everybody around my corner, the Fullers, myself, Joe next door, who had just put $20,000, $40,000 in his house on a metal roof and vinyl siding because he did it with me under the Beautiful Blocks, Beautiful Blocks program. I was Beautiful Blocks captain for two years in a row. Jessica wanted to paint her house, but now we, we were going to do it with the Beautiful Blocks, but we can't now because we don't know what to do. Who wants to put fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars $16,000 in your house now? So thank, for, thank you. I'm thank sorry. You. You're, you're, I don't want to interrupt. You got my, but, yeah, so anyway, we need a table, we need time, and if they keep those properties, they need to come to the zoning board independently, and we need a say. And when they did the spot, I know Ed said he was at the meeting when they did the spot rezoning. I live right across the street from that, that school. You would be able to put a, st a stick from my steps to their steps. And they we were never told there was going to be a zoning thing ever. Today they sent us another flyer, Thank good neighbor flyer. Thank you, Doris. Okay. I, I'm, I'm, I overstayed but, my no, welcome. But, no, but, <laughs> okay, no, that's good. Any, no, but any additional comments you have, please just put them in writing because yeah. we do want to consider everything you, yeah. you have to say. I just wanted to say, though, if they could send out a neighbor thing saying that on the 200 and 400 they're letting the fire department play with their empty houses, they could send out a notice saying what they plan to do. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Be well. <clears throat> uh, that exhausts the sign-in sheet. Would anyone else like to address council this evening? Just please state your name um, for the record, please. Sure. My name is uh, Joffrey McGregor, and I'm with Lamar Outdoor Advertising. Um, I'm probably going to be here all of one minute. I mean, obviously, with the uh, upgrade in the zoning ordinance, there is um, um, going to be uh, uh, upgrades to the, the sign ordinance as well. And, and from what we can tell, they're, they're fairly minimal. But there's going to be a couple of things that, that we would, we would uh, uh, ask be examined and, and uh, um, I'll be happy to follow up by email with you folks and, and, or, or through the, the city clerk's office. They basically involve spacing. They involve uh, uh, some, some uh, s locations where there's permitted by right uses. I mean, specifically uh, the HC highway commercials, um, which basically uh, uh, lie adjacent mainly to expressways and interstate highways, where, where my company and other companies generally have signs. Uh, under the proposed ordinance, they would not be a permitted by right use there, so that would be a concern. And the other uh, concern, quite honestly, is about spacing. Uh, Donnie King knows, you know, some of the meetings of the zoning board, we've had a lot of different interpretations about spacing between signs. Uh, there's language in there that we think needs to be tightened up. And last but not least, a, a major concern of ours, as, as Don knows as well, is uh, 
there, there's been a, what we feel is, is a real proliferation of, of wall signs throughout the city, these vinyls that people are putting up, uh, and, and a real close examination of, of the language of the curtain ordinance uh, seems to indicate that there's a loophole there that you know, allows some of these signs to go up. I think that needs to be tightened as well. So we'll point, point you guys in the direction of the language, and, and you know, hopefully we can you know, tighten things up the way they ought to be. And that's really all I have. All right, thank right. you very much. My, my pleasure, thank you for the time. Would anyone else like to address council? Okay, just before we adjourn the public hearing, I do want to say thank you to everyone uh, that came out. We are going to take your, you know, your, your comments into consideration. We're going to attend uh, meetings upcoming between the neighborhood groups. Um, I think, you know, we've showed a willingness to do that so far. Um, and like I said, this is going to be, this is the start of the process. It's nowhere near the end of it. So thank you all for your time. And if there's no further business, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. This public hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Visit ectv.network for the ECTV program schedule, city and county meeting rebroadcasts, and more. ECTV, Electric City Television, live municipal broadcasts on Comcast, Channel 19.